remind you of anyone? Nope. What? <gasps> no, anything but that. Okay, teach me, Doctor. Splinter's portrayal is by far one of the most heavily criticized and contentious aspects of Rise. We're going to discuss how Splinter's characterization centers around generational trauma, something I feel not only goes unnoticed in a lot of criticisms about his character, but also in how Rise's writing is structured. Spoilers, by the way. Splinter's family is responsible for devoting their lives to correcting the mistakes of their ancestor, Oroku Saki, for his use of the Dark Armor by preventing its fragments from being reassembled. Splinter, or Hamato Yoshi, loses his mother at a young age because of her duties when she's forced to leave him in her father's care, and it's a moment he's kept buried for years, knowing how deeply it hurt him. Yoshi grew to resent his family's responsibility, largely in parts of losing his mother. He feels that he lost her for nothing, and it leads to his estrangement with his grandfather, and presumably the rest of his family. Even body language-wise, it's specifically this loss that's a sore point in what spurs an argument with his grandfather. This is your duty, just as it was your mother's. He doesn't hate his grandfather here, and is even remorseful that they grew apart. It's more nuanced than that. He specifically hated the unfair burden that was thrown on him as early as childhood, and came to resent how it resulted in the loss of his mother for a thankless job. It's cruel to ask that much sacrifice of a child. As a result, this splinter decides to rebel read his own destiny, and went on to become a famous actor and pursue a life of self-indulgence. There's even a detail where Lujitsu's movie voice doesn't have the same accent he has off-camera, alluding to the concept of code switching through his voice being redubbed for a production. Hello, I am action star Lujitsu. Aren't you cute? Then, where do I start? This man got kidnapped by his girlfriend, who he just proposed to, is exploited for profit and being forced to fight against his will in the Battle Nexus, gets kidnapped a second time, is experimented on by a scientist, was mutated and left as an unhoused man slash single father of four non-human children he didn't ask for. He's lost his fame, his fortune, his home, his family, and even his body. This is why he spends so much time living vicariously through his own movies as a reminder of what he once had. In the episode Turtle Digger Nights, The Ballad of the Ratman, he lies to his kids to enter their vehicle in a destruction derby for a taste of the kind of life and glory he had before. Downey finds out and is deeply hurt by being lied to after he spends the entire episode chasing after his dad's approval, and Splinter recognizes the harm he caused by lying to his sons and gives a serious and sincere apology. So when the boys are mad that Splinter's idea of training them when they ask for it early on is to pop in a Lujitsu movie and tell them to copy the movements, there's an entire layer of hurt they don't even realize they inflicted when Leo tells them, what would you know, you're just a rat. With all this in mind, it makes sense that Rai Splinter differs from other incarnations of the series in that he doesn't prioritize training his kids to fight, and that he swore off violence until seeing something so immoral, he refused to be a bystander. He just wants them to have carefree lives and for them to pursue their interests because he treats them as children first. There's not the same threat of getting caught or having to defend themselves there were in other versions because there's a fully functional yokai society, and half the time the turtles get spotted by other yokai mutants pulling the same disguise gag as them. But then he finds out the Shredder is a very real threat in the episode Shadow of Evil. Even then, his first instinct is to try and deal with it and collect the pieces himself not involving his family, only to see his age is catching up to him and he's in over his head. It's this narrative turning point that prompts the guys receiving formal training in the second half of the first season and changes how the episodes are framed and structured. Most of the later season 1 episodes after this consist of the boys training, looking for armor pieces, or taking a break from training. I feel the entire season 1 finale of Splinter consulting his scroll makes the generational trauma aspect pretty on the nose because the boys go so hard in not wanting to disappoint him after screwing up that they don these new personas and go with Splinter's harmful, grow up and be ready to sacrifice everything attitude. Everyone, from April to the villains, all think it's weird and forced to them because, well, it is. They're not trying to disappoint their dad, but last minute training was never going to work. 
No amount of training would have fixed how unreasonable it was to put that much responsibility onto a bunch of kids at the 11th hour. It's not to say they don't improve at all, they do, and even remark on it. And it's further sold by the scenes of Splinter holding back tears from how proud he is of them when he sees they're trying their best, even when it's not perfect. Before the final chase after the armor, we have a scene where Splinter tells the boys they need to let go of their childish ways, become an extension of their ancestors, and be ready to sacrifice everything. We see them all throw away their toys and all the things related to their interests, donning new costumes, and the boys trying so hard to be serious that it just comes across as awkward. Mikey rips a sticker off his chest and forcibly toughens up because he thinks that's the right thing to do. Men don't cry, am I right? Splinter later sees the harm this attitude caused when his own ancestors callously tell him to sacrifice his children's lives, guard the final armor piece himself in isolation, and be grateful for the opportunity. He tells his ancestors to fuck off. He shreds them and then proceeds to solo the entire Foot Clan. Even wilder, nobody manages to take down Splinter when he does this, not even Draxum. Splinter only surrenders to ensure the safety of his sons. He also apologizes to them before the final confrontation with Draxum Shredder, which is what prompts them to strip off the outfits that rob them of their individuality. So you're not mad at us? No. It is not training, or rules, or tradition that makes you special. It is being yourselves. If I'd had faith in how special you each are, none of this would have happened. They did the best they could, but in the end, they were never going to succeed at this mission with these circumstances, and that's not their fault. They do improve their skills tremendously. But in the end, the task they were asked to do was beyond unreasonable, and Splinter apologizes for making them follow the way of the same people who told them to sacrifice their lives, and for stripping them of their childhood, and in turn, making them feel like his love and approval for them was conditional on their performance. Yeah, no one is, but Papa will chew his tail off if we don't stick to the rule book. Well, look where the rule book landed us! In many ways, it's reflective of the same unfair trauma Splinter himself experienced, something he consciously tried to avoid passing to them. The audience can understand why things turned out this way because of the urgency of the Shredder's return, but Rise relies on the heavy dramatic irony of the audience knowing about the dark armor pieces that showed up several times before the Turtles learned what they were. It's that dramatic irony that shapes several of the early episodes. The first portion of Season 1 is the boys taking on small-time villains, most of the time not even actually to stop them, but to improve themselves as a team and feel like heroes. They go out of their way to pick small crimes, and even then they rarely beat the villains and are more of just a group of pests who cause problems than a legitimate threat. For instance, they run into the Foot Clan on multiple occasions, but the Turtles aren't actively seeking them out. They run into them by chance, not even realize their goal of collecting the dark armor pieces, or what those are, or why they're dangerous. That's why they thwart the foot and take the ring in the episode The Longest Fight, not realizing it's the armor piece they were after. In the episode Stuck on You, the boys don't actually care about beating the villains. It's more about Raph genuinely trying to help everyone improve as a team, and them recognizing the effort he put into that, and following through on that idea because they love him. There's actually a threat here, because the foot is collecting the dark armor piece, but the guys don't know that, and by this point the audience hasn't been explicitly told that yet. Had they known, they would have had a clearer goal of what they're doing. In the episode Operation Normal, Leo and Don are focused on protecting April and her new friend Sunita, both of whom are being harassed by the Foot Clan. They don't know this, but the Foot wants Sunita's boots because they're a part of the dark armor. Their priority here is April's safety. This isn't the turtle's fault, mind you. They're a bunch of untrained kids who shouldn't be pursuing supervillains in the first place. It's not until the end of Shadow of Evil that they're taught about any of the threats and they shift their attention to finding the dark armor pieces, where before their only major mission they focused on was the containment of the ooze mosquitoes, which they personally saw themselves. It comes back to Splinter not taking his family duties seriously, and even that was a direct result of the trauma he experienced as a child for having lost his mother and for having such an unfair burden placed on him as a child. He wants to avoid having that same burden on his kids, 
but the circumstances of the Shredder's return are thrown onto them anyway. That also helps contextualize not just Splinter's behavior, but also his children. Donnie and Leo, for example, are shown to be deeply insecure in numerous instances and crave approval from others to feel that they have value. Donnie repeatedly talks about how much he craves approval from parent-aged adults, while Leo latches on to several men in the show as surrogate father figures. Hashtag give Leo his black dad. Mikey is probably the most secure of the group, even having a literal therapist persona he uses to give out advice or to be blunt and direct when he needs it. But he's also the youngest of the family, and his entire family is very protective, if not a little overprotective of him. Dude has like three dads. More than anyone though, I think the generational aspect of Rise is best shown in Raphael. He's very overprotective, and in a lot of ways is a father figure as well as the oldest brother. He stepped up and filled a role he saw Splinter wasn't always able to, due to his own trauma. In many ways, Raph is a parentified child, trying his best to fill the void of neglect. Wow, Dad really beefed this one. Tweety, Mommy has to go. No, Mommy, please stay. Poor little guy. No wonder he turned his back on the Hamato clan. <laughs> And who put all these tears in my eyes? By the end of the series, Raph is pressured to be the one to form a plan and feels that it's entirely his responsibility to get everyone ready to face these terrifying odds. Raph's large build and imposing design makes it easy to forget that at the end of the day, he's a scared kid who has no idea what to do and is burdened with all the pressure. His fear is completely understandable here. He might be the oldest, but he's only a year older and just a kid. By this point, they've lost their parental guidance. Nobody else knows what to do. He's scared and angry with himself. In the end, the resolution here is to fall back and trust his family the way they trust him, and that he doesn't have to put everything on himself. Splinter is by no means a perfect father, but despite in how many ways he's neglectful or not as active as would be ideal, he makes up for it by the unending kindness and support he shows others, not even just his sons. Uh. Being a single parent is um, uh, what I wanted to... Uh, I, I, I did not mean to lose my temper earlier. It is just that sometimes, as a father... I feel that also makes him far more interesting and engaging in how he passes wisdom to others. He gives advice and support to both April and Cassandra, for example, but his advice is less of a wise old man magical Asian stereotype and more of... I've made a lot of screw-ups in my life, and it's not too late for you to change, which makes his reaching out feel that much more authentic. Particularly with how he tries to support and persuade Cassandra for no other reason than just kindness. Cassandra was never really a bad person, but more a misguided kid taking harmful mentorship from the wrong people. I do need to point out that this is a series that has always been steeped in Orientalism, and Rise is no exception to this. It adds to the trend of Asian characters in children's media overwhelmingly being tied to martial arts, mysticism, all of which goes hand in hand with the Orientalism aspect. TMNT's entire premise is almost entirely steeped in a lot of exoticized Japanese mysticism. You strike a wounded warrior, you have no honor. I fight to win. Orientalism, broadly speaking, is the depiction of the East as viewed through a Eurocentric white supremacist lens. It studies how people within what is labeled as the East, including many Asian and North African cultures, are viewed and framed. Often, many of the narratives and tropes are directly drawn from non-fictional systems of oppression, and those narratives are weaponized to justify appropriation, dehumanization, and violent harm toward these people. It takes an exoticized concept of an Asian person, but removes all the humanity from that person, often casting white guys to do their impressions of Asian people who are stereotyped as being incredibly strict, obsessed with duty and honor, speaking gibberish, or speaking in riddles and weird expressions, and all being skilled in martial arts. Fighting skills are only part of the ninja way. It is also our philosophy, our belief. You mean, if I use the Crane Brain Drainer to implant your ideas in those robots, they'll be able to defeat Sonic? Well, to fight the Hedgehog! Hold up! Prepare to lose, Hedgehog! We are Robot Ninja! Now they're even starting to talk like that old bird! The tomato of expectation makes the soup of happiness! Is everybody gonna be talking this way? 
Something very important to understand about Orientalism, and really any kind of racial analysis with media, is that it's not about if these are admirable qualities to have in a character, and more about what kind of narrative or framing it creates. Because Orientalist tropes are harmful for constructing narratives used to justify the existence of real-world systems of oppression. It doesn't mean that watching this one show is literally going to brainwash you into hating people, nor can it be approached with like a preschooler TV show understanding of media analysis where there's some very simplified lesson to be learned, usually spelled out by a character at the end. I can relate example with my experience as a black person and the dutiful slave trope as it relates to anti-black violence. This is a trope used quite a bit throughout US history that imagines black people in subservient positions as happy, loyal, and so caring toward the white families that treat them well that they would do anything to protect them. Mammy loved being with y'all, sweetie. Don't question that yucky systemic disenfranchisement, violence, and abuse. She loves being with y'all. Within the context of these actual stories, things like loyalty, duty, and love are all admirable qualities. But the issue here isn't if they are treated as virtuous or good people, but the way the commentary connects real-world systemic abuse to the story and is used to centralize the comfort of white viewers by letting them see the consequences of slavery and colonialism as something that was better for everyone and was a real-world justification for anti-black policy. Films like that that allude to or outright discuss anti-black racism or misogynoir, like Hidden Figures, The Help, even Princess and the Frog, Make sure to throw in these impossibly supportive and progressive white characters who are often fictionalized when they write about real historical events to centralize the problems onto a few singular characters, and it's not a system that every white person is complicit in. These characters exist to give white viewers a person to project comfort onto. In their parlance, sure, racism was bad, but there were plenty of good white people ready to lend a hand. It allows white viewers to see systemic bigotry from a third-person perspective that they are not complicit in, so long as they have the good one to project onto. Orientalism relies on a similar concept, just with a different demographic of people being observed and extracted from by Eurocentrism. Take a common trope associated with Egyptian mysticism, the concept of the virgin land, which itself is a phrase that frames the land in a very specific way, but I digress. This video is already going to be super long as it is. Egypt is very often portrayed as a barren wasteland of nothing but sand, pyramids, curses, and mummies. Mummies as a monster trope could have an entire discussion of their own, but it often goes hand in hand with a white explorer uncovering a lost treasure of some kind for an entertaining journey. This repeat narrative of imagining lands, cultures, or areas as empty with simple backwards people is because it's used to reframe the conversation around colonialism. It's easy to justify the acquisition and conquering of land and people when you imagine it as empty and uninhabited, or imagine the people there as backwards, patriarchal, and misogynistic and in need of saving. Thus, the virgin land and white savior tropes were born. I'll give you a good deal. Buy my sand. Buy my sand. Buy from me. <laughs> Thrived isn't the word I'd use. Why? We've got food, water, fresh bandages in lieu of pay, a kind and merciful god king. What's the outside got that we don't? He doesn't bring you the sun. He keeps it from you. <gasps> the DuckTales reboot has an episode that plays this trope fairly straight. You can tell from interviews and in watching the show itself that the writers were very aware of the racial and specifically orientalist tropes of DuckTales as a concept. A Scottish pioneer who immigrates to America values bootstrapping hard work and goes around collecting treasures from cultures and other people to build his wealth is going to veer into that. And while they've actively adjusted several of the most blatant racist caricatures like the Bombi and Ferris Jin, the same general narratives and tropes are still baked into the series' premise. This can also play into the concept of othering, which is the framing of another group of people as alien, deviant, or inherently abnormal. A common Orientalist trope that does this is the conflation of Arabs with the religious faith of Islam. Orientalism often relies on mixing and matching Asian and North African people into one big, vague cultural sludge where they're all the same people. Othering them allows you to basically mix and match these things as a quick way to establish characters as villainous or antagonistic specifically because of their features. 
Disney's Aladdin does this by having Agrabah be a mix of Arab and Indian culture. Aladdin and Jasmine are drawn with features more associated with Europeans, while the more overtly villainous characters are drawn to be more stereotypically Arab. Often Asians are systemically denied opportunities to write or create their own works, and instead it's often white, or at least non-Asian people, putting on a bad accent. With TMNT, Splinter has only recently started to have Asian VAs, and only one of them, who then got replaced by a white guy, was Japanese. Asian people and many other oppressed racial minorities are often systemically denied these opportunities, even when the story would literally directly relate to that specific need or experience. One example is one of the main characters of BoJack Horseman, Diane. She is voiced by a white woman, despite the fact that the character is Vietnamese. The showrunner, Bob Waksberg, has actually addressed this, but it's still ridiculous to me that people can act as if they just happened into this and don't know better. You don't just forget people of color in your story heavily involving feminism and social justice topics in nearly every episode. The episode that always sticks out to me is the one where Diane tries firing a gun at target practice for the first time and writes about the feeling of power and safety that she as a woman feels since before she had been firmly against gun ownership. You don't think an Asian woman living in the US who reads, writes, and talks about social justice all the time would have anything to say about guns, violence, and gender as it relates to her racial identity? It's honestly tiring seeing producers contribute directly to this, acknowledge it, and move on only for it to be repeated over and over again. If there were just one show, it wouldn't be the end of the world, but multiply this a thousand times over, every time with the showrunner saying how they've learned their lesson or they just picked the best person for the job, and you have the current day institutional exclusion we have now. Orientalism at its core is an imagined vision of real oppressed people by a dominant group, in a way that excludes them from their own portrayal and reinforces real world systemic oppression. That doesn't mean that cartoons, movies, or video games are literally out there oppressing people, it just means that these writings are drawn from narratives used to reframe our understanding of systems of oppression and help rationalize the dehumanization of oppressed people. TMNT and the martial arts aesthetic in general runs into a similar issue. Martial arts is not inherently damaging, but it's a continued adopted aesthetic of Asian people that does not actually include them, and is rooted in real-life historical violence toward Asian people. The fact that Splinter is a rat, a real-life way to derogate Asian people, and actively used in propaganda to incite Asian violence, further contributes to that. I don't think this was done maliciously, but it is a consequence of the systemic denial of access for Asian and many other oppressed people. This applies not just to the entertainment industry, but almost every industry in existence, unfortunately. Islamophobia is here and real. Asian violence is here and real. Violence toward numerous racial minorities with these very rationalizations are here and real. It's not lost on me that TMNT was made by white guys and that Rise had a group of white producers. It shows. I feel I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't point out not just Rise Splinter's designs and how the exaggerated Japanese features make him look like actual propaganda posters used to harm Japanese people but also the way the entire franchise is built on an exoticized lens of Japanese culture. This subject could be an entire talk on its own, but I'm not the one to make it. Um, I'm black, and I'm staying in my lane. If you do want that more in-depth framework for understanding it, Edward Said provides a really good read, Orientalism, if should you want to read more on the topic. Another aspect I find interesting about Splinter, particularly considering that Rise emphasizes him being a Japanese immigrant, is the motif of extraction and exploitation. You see, a central theme in Splinter's trauma is that all of the villains love or admire him in some way, but their love is more a form of objectification. Big Mama dated him and has strong romantic feelings for him, and yet she kidnapped him, forced him to fight for her profit, and kept him in prison for years. Baron Draxum admired his fighting prowess and strength. I'm pretty sure he had the gay awakening of his life here, and yet he kidnapped Splinter from his imprisonment and first kidnapping, mutated him to create what he intended to be child soldiers, and quite literally dehumanized him. 
The Foot Clan guys gush multiple times over Jujutsu's acting skills, his movies, openly expressing how cool he is, how much they love his films, how inspiring they were to his lives, and none of that stopped them from trying to resurrect the Shredder or telling him how to extract Splinter's life essence. Oh, and Shredder wants to extract Splinter's life essence to become invincible, by the way. One of the last episodes of the series is Splinter checking in on his Lujitsu dojos, only to learn that most of them have been erased and taken over by a white martial artist. Even when Splinter and April succeed in defending the last dojo, Splinter still specifically expresses joy in knowing that his legacy lives on in April and the Turtles. All of the villains claim to love, admire, and respect Hamato Yoshi, but in reality, they dehumanize, exploit, and appropriate from him for themselves. They love his movies, his athleticism, and his body, and so they all take what they want from him and discard the humanity of the man they claim to idolize so much. They keep saying how much they love and respect him, but what they love is a dehumanized aesthetic of Splinter. They see him as a resource, and it's a large source of trauma and frustration for Splinter. As a black person, I, I can't tell you how often I felt this way. You're rarely seen as an actual person, and when you show any of your talents off, you're quickly exploited and seen as something to be drawn from by many white people. I don't even know what else to say, but if you're a racial minority, you, you get it. And hopefully you can understand why that subtext with Splinter being treated as a resource here would cut deep. Now, I'm not at all convinced that that was intentional of the writers, but something I feel would have been caught by and expanded on had they been given one more time and two more non-white writers. Another thing I love about Rise Splinter is that while he hasn't shared much about the family history until midway through the series, the boys have a lot of their favorite media shaped by what Splinter has exposed them to. My mom did this for my brother and I, and I know a lot of non-white parents who do this, but parents end up being curators for the kind of stories, toys, and media you're exposed to that help shape your development. And that shines here too. Yes, he shares Lujitsu movies because it's literally him, but that doesn't change how the kind of toys, movies, and TV series the boys watch are all things that still show a breadth of racial consciousness. When the boys start a band, Raphael dresses up as James Brown. This again falls under things I don't credit the writers for, but it's something I feel non-white writers would pick up on and expand on. TMNT has always had a ton of media within media. The Turtles have always loved comic books, movies, TV shows, and media in general. And sure, it's a vehicle to make a bunch of pop culture references that are teenagers, but I think it's also useful to think about the fact that media is especially important to the Turtles throughout the franchise because they cannot engage with society or connect with most of the world because it's not designed for their inclusion. Their sense of identity is heavily shaped by the kind of media they engage with specifically because of their identity. It reminds me of a brief scene from the movie Bay Bay's Kids. One of the main characters, LaShawn, is rummaging through several toys here until she sees a doll of a dark-skinned black woman. And she just looks at it so lovingly and hugs it. I, I don't have anything to add, I just really love this scene and the relationship the boys have with their toys, media interests, and overall growth reminds me so much of this moment. There's an earlier scene where they feel annoyed and excluded looking at nameplates of the gift shop, seeing that their names, LaShawn and Khalil, names that are common for them and indeed many black people are nowhere to be found. It's just a stinging reminder, paired with the profiling harassment they face at this theme park, that they're viewed as threats because of their blackness. No cutting in line, no grumbling, no stealing, that means you. Baby Kids deals a lot with black kids not having a capacity to properly be kids and have fun due to financial circumstances and because they face racial discrimination. They go to a theme park, but while they're there, they're profiled multiple times, they're punished and scrutinized for things white children around them are not punished for, and they're not given capacity to be human or properly be treated as such. I implore you to follow the experiences of transracial children adopted by parents who don't take their racial identities into consideration, and it causes a great deal of trauma in the ways they condition their children from birth because of Eurocentrism. I'm not a huge fan of Splinter being booed up with the guy who tried killing everyone and who mutated him. 
The good idea is there, and I love the idea of reconciling with someone who he wasn't on great terms with to really push the idea of different families, but it's not well executed when it's with the main villain, to say nothing of the queer-coded aspect of Draxum as one of the main villains. Splinter as a bisexual king? Love it. Divorced dad episodes? Love it. Complicated family dynamics? Mwah. Just give him a better man, because pairing Splinter and having this whole I made your family when he made them weapons and mutated this man and robbed him of so much just doesn't fit together well. Draxum didn't make this family, okay? If they had a separate villain do all the worst stuff and Draxum was like a side villain without the same baggage, then there'd be room to make it work. That's not even getting into the fact that he converted a bunch of people by way of the ooze mosquitoes, which initially acted as a way to have villains of the week, but could also be used as a way for Draxon to take responsibility for his actions, like maybe helping return those people to normal or something. That said, I recognize that season 2 was gutted to pieces, a lot of this was very rushed or rewritten writing, very likely nowhere near the intended vision of the production crew. Some people take issue with the fact that Splinter refers to his sons by their colors, and I don't quite know why. It's very apparent that they're endearing nicknames, like how he calls Donatello Funny One at one point. In several serious moments, though, he punctuates his seriousness by calling them their actual names. 278 days ago, you said hi, Purple, to Raph. Donatello? <gasps> I may have lied about this event, but I never lied about wanting to spend time with you. Get out of here! We will buy you time! We're not leaving without you two! Raphael! As long as there are Hamato, there is hope! Leonardo? Parents give their kids nicknames all the time, and Splinter very clearly drops the nicknames in favor of their actual names on numerous occasions. This is also a common writing trick, too. Give your characters lots of different nicknames or have them addressed differently by different characters. The different names help prevent scripts from being overloaded with the same name a dozen times, but it also acts as a form of characterization, because the casual ways people refer to conveys their relationship. A lot of people love that the boys in Rise call Splinter Dad or Pops, rather than the more distant Father or Master Splinter. That's it right there. Hey, Pop! Splints! You can't be in here! You fuzzy cuddleopagus. Lou, how can I help? You knew this day was coming, rat. These themes of unfair burdens at a young age, generational trauma, and recognizing the way it harms and shapes not just you, but your family members, and still standing up to support those who haven't been ideal but still loving to you, I'd say is a large part of why Rise resonates with so many marginalized people. We live that experience every day. Everything, from Karai standing up to her father, to their magic system literally connecting you to past generations, to the resolution having the entire family capped with the return of Splinter's mother? makes it pretty on the nose. Now, yes, real-life generational trauma is more often a consequence of more systemic issues like white supremacy, systemic poverty, capitalism, and other structural issues, and not one of your ancestors wearing an evil magic power suit. But this angle of imagining Splinter brings a lot of new elements to the table. Generational trauma and how it affects your family is a very big theme in Rise. The generational trauma aspect, I'd argue, is also why the Rise cast is so heavily read as Asian or black-coded. It's not to say that the writers are even perfect at it due to many of the issues I mentioned. The industry of production as a whole has an issue of who has access to even create these kind of works, and unfortunately Rise is no exception when it comes to not properly including more Asian and Black writers and producers, particularly in leadership positions. That said, I believe that understanding generational trauma is central to understanding the kind of story that Rise is telling. But please stop having white guys running these shows. 